Bismillah alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa man tamassaka bi sunnatihi ila yawmiddin thumma amma ba'd alhamdulillah ala ni'mat al-islam wa sunnah all praise and thanks belong to Allah for guiding us to Islam and for guiding us to the sunnah hadathani jama'atun min al-shuyukh bi isnad kullin ila Sufyan bin Uyayna an عمر بن دينار عن أبي قابوس مولى عبد الله بن عمر عن عبد الله بن عمر بن عاص رضي الله تعالى عنهما أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال الراحمون يرحمهم الرحمن ارحموا من في الأرض ارحمكم في السماء The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said in his tremendous hadith and this hadith is a hadith that is مسلسل بالأولية This is a hadith that the scholars of hadith they would teach their pupils this hadith, the first hadith, yani, um, when the, the students began studying with them, so as to highlight and to draw their attention to knowledge and the goal of knowledge and the effects of knowledge upon its carrier and the effects of knowledge upon the, the people in the earth. The Prophet وسلم, he said what translated means and those who are merciful, they will be shown mercy by the most merciful. So be merciful to those who are in the earth and the one who is above the heavens and will show you mercy. The ulama they mention, they say, This is because knowledge is mercy. It's, it's result. The result of knowledge is mercy. And the ultimate goal of knowledge is mercy in the hereafter. So the dunya. The result of knowledge is mercy in the dunya. The ultimate goal of knowledge is mercy in the hereafter. We continue going over that tremendous hadith, the hadith that is collected by Abu Huraira, min hadith Abi Huraira radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, fima rawahu al-Bukhari fi sahih and that which Bukhari he brings inside of his collection of authentic hadith, and is a hadith that is hadith al-Qudsi, faqara Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna Allah ta'ala qal, that verily Allah the Most High said, or Inna Allah qal, that verily Allah he said, Man adali waliyan, that whoever has enmity for a wali of mine, faqad adhantuhu bil harb, then I declare war upon that person. Wa ma taqarraba, wa ma taqarraba ilayya abadi bi shayin ahabba ilayya, mimma naftaratuhu alayh, wa mimma naftaratuhu alayh, naam. That and my slave does not draw near to me with anything more beloved to me than that which I made obligatory upon them. Which brings us to the portion of the hadith we want to take in today's class, which is from the next sentence on to the rest of the hadith, to the end of the hadith. And that is the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَلَا يَزَالُ عَبَدِي and that my slave will continuously do the voluntary righteous deeds until I love him. Meaning the voluntary righteous deeds in addition to the obligatory deeds. Because the obligatory deeds must be established full stop. And in addition to the establishment of that which is obligatory, also voluntary has to be added to it. And then if voluntary is added to it, Yani Allah Ta'ala says they will do this consistently until I love them. Then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, He goes on to say, فَإِذَا أَحْبَبْتُهُ And once I have loved him, كُنْتُ سَمْعَهُ الَّذِي يَسْمَعُ بِهِ Then I will be his hearing by way in which he hears. وَمَصْرَهُ الَّذِي يُبُصِّرُ بِهِ And I will be his eyes by way in which he sees, or his sight by way in which he sees. And I will be his legs by way in which, or excuse me, I will be his arms or his hands by way in which he grabs and he touches and, and the like. And I will be his legs by way in which he walks. And if he were to ask me, then verily indeed, most definitely, I will give unto him. I will answer his request. And if he were to ask 
my protection or seek refuge in me, then I will grant him protection and grant him refuge from that in which he is seeking refuge from. No doubt, this is something that we should all strive our best to aspire for. To aspire for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to love us. This is what it's all about. Naam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He loves us. As the ulama, they mentioned that laysa uh, shatan and to hib. Walakinna shatan kulla shatan and to hib. That the issue is not that we love Allah. That, that's that's not really the, the issue. That's not the topic. That's not really, you know, the point. And and why why how come this is not the point that we love Allah? Is because everybody who is sane, everybody who is who is sane loves Allah. And I'm, you have to be crazy, you have to be a complete evil and despicable individual to not love Allah. You have to be completely out of your mind to not love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any sane, rational person that has within them good, they love Allah. Now, this is this is not even a question. Now, not even a question. We all love Allah. Anybody who is sane, rational, yani has a working brain and mind, they love Allah. Now, so that's not really the question. But rather the question and the issue. And, and and really the main point is that what is that Allah loves us. Naam is that we are loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with that being the case, we have to learn what are those things by way in which if we do them, Allah will love us. How are we to be so that Allah will love us? Naam. So this hadith gives us a roadmap. It gives us a roadmap. Naam. Now there, there are many texts. From the text that gives us indications of things in which we have to do to try to earn the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because we can never really do it and never really earn it. Naam? Because our deeds will never reach that level. However, from Allah's grace, if we take the steps that he taught us in the kitab and the sunnah to take, then Allah ta'ala, he will love us with all of our shortcomings. With all of our flaws, with all of our deficiencies, even though we come up short consistently, Allah will love us. Bithnilahi ta'ala. So, if we want Allah to love us, we have to establish what is obligatory. The establishment of the obligatory deeds is a must, full stop. There's no question about that. That which is obligatory has to be established. Point blank, period. End of story. Has to be established. If you want Allah to love you, you have to establish the obligatory deed. So, for example, if we take the prayer for an example. If we want Allah to love us, how many times a day do we have to pray? Five. Without question, without exception, five times a day is the amount of times we have to pray if we want Allah to love us. Also, if you want Allah to love us, then we also we need to bring the voluntary acts of prayer. So those sunnah prayers, right? The nawafil, the sunnah prayers, the voluntary prayers, like the two units of prayer before fajr, we have to do it if we want Allah to love us, right? Okay. The sunnah prayers before and after Lord, we have to do it if we want Allah what, to love us, right? The sunnah prayer after maghrib, right? We have to do it if we want what Allah to love us. And the sunnah after isha, we have to do it if we want Allah to love us. And we have to do it in a manner that is what? Consistent if we want Allah to love us. So the establishment of the obligatory deeds and then to consistently establish the voluntary deeds this is the roadmap if we want to be from those whom Allah loves. 
full stop. Okay? Now, again, I mentioned the other characteristic that I'll mention aside of the kitab and the sunnah of traits of those who yani, uh, are loved by Allah that they have, that we have to strive to, to learn what they are and adorn ourselves with them. Because, again, it's not about the fact that we love, but it's about whether or not we are loved. Naam, طيب. So the Fadilat al-Shaykh, the Muhaddith, Muhaddith al-Madina, al-Shaykh, Shaykh Abdul al-Muhsin, al-Abad al-Badr, Hafizahullah Ta'ala, he mentions, in commenting on the rest of this hadith, he says, al-Nawafil hiya al-Ityanu bil-A'mal al-Saliha ziyadatan ala al-Fara'id. He said that the voluntary al-Nawafil, was meant by Nawafil, the voluntary, right, super obligatory, then this is bringing about the righteous good deeds and establishment of the righteous good deeds in addition, on top of, in concert with what? The obligatory. Now, that the voluntary is the establishment of the righteous good deeds that are in addition to, along with what? The obligatory. Now, so we have to do the obligatory. Obligatory is that's default. That's a must. No question. And then from that, we do the voluntary as much as we can. So with the voluntary, imagine now, now <laughs> mind you, we do the voluntary as much as we can. I didn't say we do the obligatory as much as we can. No, no. We do the obligatory to the best of our ability, but what? Everything we're supposed to do, that's obligatory. Right? But the voluntary, we do the voluntary as much as we can because we want to establish this upon consistency. Ma'am, so the Shaykh mentions, he says, عليها, and doing it consistently, that we consistent. So when it comes to doing the voluntary consistent, a manner by way in which we could reach this consistency is by pacing ourselves in the beginning. Because as the Prophet وسلم, informed us, as it comes to the hadith that has been collected by Al-Bukhari, أَحَبُّ الدِّينَ إِنَ اللَّهِ أَدْوَمُ that the most beloved deen unto Allah is that which is most consistent. Naam, the most beloved deen, meaning the most beloved deed to Allah is that which is the most consistent, meaning from the voluntary deeds. So we have to strive to pace ourselves so that we could establish consistency. Naam, so those voluntary deeds that you can do, look at it and think about it and start establishing them bit by bit consistently so i want you to look at the voluntary deeds that you can do on a consistent basis and then start to establish those and then what you do is that you add on to that bit by bit you add on to it bit by bit from what that what you can do consistently that what you can do consistently because doing the obligatory and then doing voluntary consistently the Shaykh, he mentions, he says, يَجْلِبُ مَحَبَّةُ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ This is the way that an individual, they would be from those whom Allah loves. This is how you will seek to gain or seek yani, Allah to love you. By doing the voluntary consistently upon what? In addition to what? The obligatory. Now, once an individual has done this once the individual has worked hard and they have become from those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves ma'am and it's so we can properly understand the rest of the hadith if you are from those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves فَإِذَا حَصَلَتْ لَهُ ma'am الْمَحَبَّةِ ظَفِرَ uh, then the individual, they would have become successful. They would have become victorious. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will set right all of their affairs. Is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will set right all of their affairs. Everything that a person does, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will set it aright 
so that it complies with the guidance. You understand that? He will set it aright so that it complies with the guidance. Everything, not just in his deen, okay? Not just when he comes to the masjid, all right? But all of his affairs, all of his life in the masjid, in the marketplace, in his place of work, on vacation, while at home, in public, in private, all of his affairs. And this is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you. Naam? So once Allah ta'ala loves you, he will set right all of your affairs. فَلَا يَسْمَعُ إِلَّا مَا هُوَ حَقٌ So he will not hear or listen to anything except that it is the truth. He will not listen to anything except that it is the truth. Wow. I just want you to think about that. All right? Because this is something for all of us to think about. What goes into our ears? Is it halal or haram? What goes into our ears? Is it halal or is it haram? Because from the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a slave is that what enters into the slave ear, meaning what he listens to, is the halal. It's halal, it's the haq. Right? So the slave is not going to listen to music. He's not going to listen to things that are haram. Naam. He's not going to listen to things that promote filth, that promote kufr, that promote hypocrisy, that promote innovation. No. They're only going to listen to the haq. Now I want you I, and I want I want this to be clear. This doesn't mean you may not hear something that is haram. Now, uh, Allah musta'an in this country, you can't go into a store to shop to buy groceries, to buy milk or to buy whatever, right? Bread and pastries and what have you. You can't go into a store without hearing music. Unfortunately. Even the Muslim establishments, Allah musta'an, even the Muslim establishments can't even go into it without hearing music. Even in the Muslim establishments, this is horrible situation. Naam, horrible situation. So what does this mean then? This means that a person, when they happen to hear the haram, they're going to avert their ears from it. They're going to avert their ears from it. They're going to do things by way in which to avoid it. Alhamdulillah, there's noise cancellation headphones and audio pods, right? Whether it be an AirPod or whatever. They are noise cancellation devices. Headphones, old school headphones. They ain't even got to be noise cancellation. It's a headphone that you can put on your ears and put on a lecture, put on some Quran. Naam. When you go shopping, so you don't got to hear that stuff. Naam. So you don't got to hear that stuff. There's situations, like if you jump inside of an Uber or something like this, and they're playing music where you can say, listen, can you turn that down? You're the customer. Naam. So don't be, don't be shy. Don't be scared. Tell them, listen, I need you to turn that down, please. Or put on NPR, put on some news or something, right? But turn that music off. And if for whatever reason... You're shy, you're scared, right? For whatever reason, you're scared, whatever. They put your earphones in. Noise cancellation or not. Put on some Quran. Put on some lecture. Put on a lecture. You don't got to worry about that. You have to worry about that, right? So this is the point. Is that a person, they will strive to use their ears in a manner that is halal. And this is from the signs that, are, that Allah Ta'ala, he loves you. وَلَا يَرَى إِلَّا مَا هُوَ الْحَقُّنْ And they will not look at, they will not, Look at anything except that it is truth. Meaning, they will not look at anything except that it is halal. If it's haram, they're not going to be staring at it. They don't mean they may not see it. 
right? You may see something that's 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 bad. You may see something that's bad. Like the man walking down the street, they may see a woman that's 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 dressed in a very inappropriate manner. That's dressed in a very inappropriate manner. She's naked, although she's dressed up. Now you might see that, but the first look what is for you, meaning you looked, you saw it. You didn't look at it, but you saw it. It was inadvertent. But anything after that is, is against you. Now, so if a person is walking down the street and he happens to look to his right and he sees something that's haram, right? Then what is, then what is he supposed to do or she's supposed to do? Then they turn her, they lower their gaze. Now, that averting look, no problem. That's not upon you. It's not against you. You just happen to look to your right. And then now this this shay, this, this uh, shaytana is standing there dressed in appropriate. So what do you do? You, you lower your gaze. You, you move your head to the other way. Now, you move your head to the other way. This is how you have to do it. It's sad, but we live in a place that's like that. Sometimes it may be a, a physical individual. Sometimes it may be a physical individual. Now, one brother one time, this is a real life story. One brother one time, he was inside of the, the supermarket at the checkout line. And he said he had a... He had a, a um, he had a situation. He said he's in a checkout line. Mind you, in the checkout line, you have a person in front of you. You have your cart. Then it's you. There's a person in person cart. Then there's a person behind you, right? It's a cart of the person behind you and the person standing there. So you're, like, you're stuck. You're jumping. You can't really go nowhere. So anyway, the brother said he looked to the right. He saw some magazine. Had a woman inappropriately dressed on it. He said, so he turned to say, okay, look away from that. Look to the front. The woman standing in front of him was improperly dressed. So what did he do? He lowered his gaze. He lowered his gaze. He said all oh, her ankles was out and her feet and, you know, uh, uh, jewelry and all this on the ankles and stuff like that. That was a problem, too. So then it, I said, so he said, he said well, so, so what you do? Brother said he went like this. He looked here. Oh, no. Look there. Oh, no. Look down. Oh, no. He said, I was start looking up at the ceiling. Was looking up at the lights. I figured I'd look over there. Why? Because then he said, oh, yeah, he looked to his left. Who's there? The cashier, a woman. So, you know, can't go to the left, can't go to the right, front, now. So he just went up. He said, you know what? I'm going to look at the lights. Be safe. So sometimes it's like that. You have to just avert your eyes now and to, to be safe. Worst case scenario, extreme situation, then what you do, just close your eyes. Close your eyes. You understand? For individuals like myself who wear glasses and, they, and their sight is not really all that good, which is a nirma, is a nirma. It really is, is a nirma, because at times, right, like you see with these, these type glasses like this, it becomes very easy to do what if I look over it like that, then I can barely see nothing. The world is blurry to me. Now, the world becomes blurry. So it's at times, you know, you use what you you know use what you got, you use what you got was at your disposal to try to get what you want, and that is to what? To not look at the haram stuff. But like I said, worst case scenario, you just, you know what? I'm just going to close my eyes. I can't, you know? Got to get out of here. So, again, these are just some practical steps and means of how we maneuver. Now, now anybody come and say, man, I seem extreme, you know what I mean? You're going to be acting like that, and that, yeah, I'm going to act like that. You know why? Because it, it's really not worth it. Because I want Allah Ta'ala to love me, and looking at the haram and constantly looking at the haram, then this is a bad sign. This is a bad sign. This is what is meant by that Allah will be his his uh, yani his, his sight by way in which he sees, meaning that he would look and gaze upon the halal. He would look and gaze upon the haq. So when he reads, he will be reading the books that are containing it truth, not the books talking about haram things, not the books talking about kufr, like magic, like the Harry Potter series and all this type. No, no, no. You don't want to read that stuff for what? But they'll look at things that are halal. So it could be a, it could be a, um, you know. Of course, you know the, the the books of the religion. We we know, we understand those, right? The books of the religion. But it could be something, you know, a book of business, a book of yani, um, a uh, biography, right? History, something. You know what I mean? Uh, you could read the news. They'll be reading things that are halal. They will not be utilizing their eyes to read kufr. They will not be utilizing their eyes to read shirk. They will not be utilizing their eyes to read bid'ah. No, but they'll be utilizing their eyes to read about tawheed, about iman, about sunnah, about those things that will benefit them in, in, in their dunya, 
So a person is taking a course, they're reading the course materials. Now nah, it's going to benefit them. A person is learning something, going to benefit and learn from that knowledge, right? School books, things like that. No problem. Uh, casual reading of things that is halal. No problem. Now, nah, and this is what it's about. Anybody coming and saying, well, I seem a little extreme. You guys seem a little rigid. You know what? So be it. Because it's about being loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you, if you want to be so liberal and that's what you're about being because you're more about you're more concerned with being quote unquote liberal than you are or oh yeah I mean, you, you're so concerned with being liberal more concerned with being liberal than 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 you are having a lot to love you then whatever and a kafik how you want whatever then you're gonna get what you're gonna get but as far as those who are concerned with having a lot to and love them they don't care about these labels uh, that, that come from the west oh you liberal you're this you're that conservative you what i care we just trying to be guided we're trying to be guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, if you call guidance um, archaic, then that's because due to a flaw in your brain, that's due to a flaw in your intellect and your understanding. That's because you are not guided. So you look at guidance and you call it misguidance, you call it archaic. All right, doesn't change the fact that it's guidance. That's as, as absurd. And this is why, you know, when people come and they say, Oh, but we're liberal. You guys need to be a little more liberal. We tell them, get out of my face with that stuff. You know, respectfully, get out of my face. Why? Because that's equivalent. A person calling the truth not liberal, right, is equivalent to a person calling the sky polka dot. Meaning that what? They're telling us that we need to be liberal. Right? So I want to make this point. I want to make it clear. They're telling us we need to be liberal, and that's what we need to shoot for. So they're saying the truth is not liberal, so therefore you have to change. So we're telling them, listen, we don't care about being liberal, right? Because the truth is the truth. The truth is the haq. And the haq, it don't have to fit what you call liberal. Because liberal is not a thing that we aspire for. We aspire to be guided. So if you want to say guidance is not being liberal... Who cares? That's why I said it's equivalent to someone coming and saying the sky is polka dot. You believe the sky is polka dot? Yeah. All right. Well, who cares? It doesn't change the fact that it's not polka dot. So how much energy am I really going to see here and give you trying to show you the sky is not polka dot? You believe it's polka dot? It's not polka dot. Here the, here's the reason why it's not polka dot. You still want to say it's polka dot? You want me? You want to convince me to say it's polka dot? I'm not gonna give any invest any more energy into you and to trying to and, and you know and and and, and to having this exchange of back and forth in any which way, shape, or form. Why? Because the sky's not polka dot. No matter what you try to say, it's not polka dot. So, you know, how much am I supposed to care about what you're saying? You can say, oh, you're not liberal. Okay, alhamdulillah. If being liberal means that you're upon batil, alhamdulillah, nope, I ain't liberal. I'm not trying to be liberal. I don't want to be liberal. Okay? If you want to say being upon the haq is archaic, all right, whatever. You call it what you want to call it. I'm going to be upon the haq, and I'm going to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded me to do, and I don't care about what you, what you say or how you feel about it. Because at the end of the affair, it's not about that person, right? It's what you tell people. In the affair, it's not about you. At the end of the fair, it's not about me. At the end of the fair, it's all about Allah loving us. That's the only thing that really matters. Everything else could fall by the wayside, and it's, and it's okay. Any event, there's a lot that could be said about that, but I'm going to leave that like that. And anyway, then as a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves us, is that what? We would be, he would, yani, we would not walk towards anything except that is the truth. So we would not utilize our legs for anything except that is the truth. We would not take anything with our hands. We would not grab or grasp or take anything with our hands or utilize our hands or our body in any way, shape, or form except in a manner that is true, in a manner that is halal. Naam? So if we see that these signs are consistent within us, and this is an indication that Allah Ta'ala, He loves us. If we see opposite, then we should take that as warning signs. If we see opposite, we should take that as warning signs. 
If Allah Ta'ala loves you, then he will honor you by answering your dua. By answering your dua and answering your requests. Naam. And he will honor you by protecting you from that in which you seek protection from. These are all signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves his slaves. And when one reflects upon this, these are all things that we all need. So it's not about the fact that we love Allah, but really what it's all about is trying to be from those whom Allah loves. The Shaykh, he goes on to mention some benefits that we benefit from this hadith. is nine takeaways. Nine takeaways from this particular hadith that we benefit from. From them, the first one, Bayanu Fadl Awliya Illah. It shows us the superiority of the Awliya, of the Awliya of Allah. I'm not going to translate Awliya. The Awliya of Allah. You know, refer back to the previous sessions, inshallah ta'ala, and they have a better understanding who are the awliya of Allah and what it, and what do you need you know, need to be from the awliya of Allah uh, in addition to what comes in point number two um, from what was mentioned in previous sessions. Naam. So it shows us the superiority of the awliya of Allah and it also shows us the danger of having enmity for them. It also shows us the danger of having enmity for them. Naam, because the one who has enmity for one who's an awliya, who's one who's a wali, yani from the awliya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one who Allah ta'ala he loves, then Allah ta'ala, he has declared war against that person. So that's extremely dangerous. Naam, it's extremely dangerous. The second point of benefit and the takeaway, anna awliya, or anna walaya, anna walaya tillah, anna walaya tillah, عز وجل تحصل بأداء الفرائض وفعل النوافل is that the individual will learn this will earn the wali status by doing the obligatory and doing the voluntary by doing the obligatory and by doing the voluntary and doing the voluntary upon what الاستمرار consistently نعم طيب the third point of benefit, أَنَّ أَحَبَّ مَا يُتَقَرَّبُ إِلَى اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلْ بِهِ أَدَاءُ الْفَرَائِضُ Is that the most beloved thing that an individual can use to draw near unto Allah, that which is most beloved unto Allah, from that which individuals draw near to Him with, then verily it is by doing that in which He has made obligatory upon them. By doing that in which He has made obligatory upon them. So if you want Allah to love you, then make sure you are excelling in the manner in which you perform the obligatory deeds. Naam, it's the first step. Naam, it's the first step, as was what was yani, due to what was mentioned here. As the first step, in light of what was mentioned here, as in, in speaking at it from this angle, is that you excel in doing that and performing that which Allah has made obligatory upon you. The fourth point of benefit is it affirms the characteristic of love for Allah is that it affirms the fact that Allah loves now I'm very important it affirms the fact that Allah loves Allah Ta'ala says yeah he would translate it means because if I love him and once I have loved him now so that it shows us that Allah Ta'ala he loves now that he loves. Jalla wa'ana. The fifth point of benefit. Tafawutul a'mal fi mahabbatillah iyaha. It shows us that Allah loves some deeds more than other deeds. Naam is a proof here that Allah loves some deeds more than other deeds. And, uh, and, and that can be clearly seen in the fact that Allah loves the obligatory, that which has made obligatory upon us, more than the nawafin, more than the voluntary. Naam, but bila shak both are beloved unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the obligatory is more loved. Naam. So and we and we see that from here. Sixth point of benefit. 
أن الفعل النوافل بعد أداء الفرائض يجلب محبة الله عز وجل is that doing the voluntary in addition to doing the obligatory that doing the voluntary after and in addition to doing the obligatory then this is what will earn an individual the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seventh point of benefit is that أَنَّ مَنْ ظَفِرَ بِمَحَبَّةِ اللَّهِ عِزَّ وَجَلٍ سَدَّدَهُ فِي سَمْعِهِ وَبَصَرِهِ وَبَطْشِهِ وَمَشِّهِ is that whoever is successful has been granted success in such that Allah loves them then Allah will guide their hearing, guide their sight, guide their grasp, meaning guide their touch and what they touch, and guide their feet and what they walk to. Now, I'm guide their walking. He will guide their touching and guide their walking. Now, these are all what from the signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves his slave. So for an example, let's let me bring you a quick example right here, which shows you uh, from a standpoint the evil of fornication and let me let me add this the evil of fornication man and woman right is that when an individual fornicates when they have sexual relations outside of marriage this is a clear sign that their hearing has been used in haram their sight has been used in haram. Their grasp, their touching has been used in haram. And they walk to the haram. Yeah? So all of these are signs that what a person is not guided in his hearing, he's not guided in his sight, he's not guided in his touching, he's not guided in his walking. These are all indications that are dangerous because they point to the they point to what the probability that Allah Ta'ala does not love this person. That's dangerous. So this is how it relates to fornication, right? Between man and female, man and woman, male and female, then what about homosexuality? Fornication still, but between man and man, that which is cursed. So it's even more. Fornication between woman and woman, where the woman is acting like a man, and the woman that acts like a man is cursed. The man that acts like a woman is cursed. So no doubt, the hearing is used in a haram manner, sight used in a haram manner, touching used in a haram manner, walking used in a haram manner. Then on top of that, they're doing something that's what that's cursed. How bad is that? But yet, but yet, they want to call us crazy and archaic and rigid when we say that sexual relations have to be in marriage. And marriage is between males and females. That's it. Full stop. But we're archaic. But we're bugging out. <laughs> All right. The eighth point, أَنَّ مَحَبَّةَ اللَّهِ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ تَجْلِبُ لِلْعَبْدِ إِجَابَةَ دُعَائِهِ وَإِعَادَتَهُ مِمَّا يَخَافُ Is that when Allah loves an individual, then as a result of this, the slave their dua will be answered. And that in which they seek refuge from, that which they are scared of, yani, those things in which they seek refuge from, from those things in which they fear, they will be granted refuge from those things and protection from those things. The ninth point of benefit that the Sheikh he mentions, and he extracts for us to have and to contemplate on, Nam, 
and these are the 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 bare minimum ones. So I want yeah, every student, every individual who's listening to this class, all of the points of benefits throughout the whole series, all of the points of benefits that the sheikh he extracts at the bare minimum, this is what I want you to focus on. This is what I want you to extract. Now, in addition to the hadith itself, the narrator, the text of the hadith, where it's collected, I want you to extract these things, that these things you could take it from the hadith. And then what you do as an exercise is that you take these points of benefit, right? Uh, or you take these extractions, these, 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 these takeaways, and then you write the portion of the hadith in which it comes from. So this takeaway comes from this statement in the hadith, this statement in the hadith. This one comes from this statement in the hadith. So I want you to do that as an exercise, inshallah ta'ala, for all of the hadith inside of this series, bithnillahi ta'ala, to do that. Now, that's an ongoing homework and lesson, inshallah ta'ala, uh, that we can really uh, get the most out of this particular uh, series. And the last point of benefit, and the thawab Allah Azza wa Jalla al Abdi yakunu bi ijabatihi matlubihi wa salama min marhubihi. And that the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his slave is that he will grant him that which he is seeking and he will protect him from that which he is fleeing. He will grant him that which he is seeking and protect them from that which he is fleeing, that which he is scared of and running away from and don't want to happen, Allah Ta'ala will grant him protection from those things. And this is the reward that they will get for doing those righteous good deeds and from being from those whom Allah Ta'ala, he loves. And then the shaykh, he goes on again into the next hadith. What? We're going to save that until the next time. فنكتفي بهذا القدر وصلى الله عليه وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وجزاكم الله خيرًا